And I want to give a big shout out to everybody that's joining us at Greenhouse. You get to see me like this today, so this is a little interesting. I have one that's at Traditions. God bless you. Welcome today. Um, and I especially, I'm going to unapologetically talk to our Greenhouse South Florida family uh, this week. As many of you know and some of you do not know, uh, our pastor in South Florida, John Lash, um, who's just an amazing man of God, and, and Nancy, his wife. Uh, but his father is sort of one of the spiritual, I don't know, influencers and, and fathers of, of our church in a lot of ways. His father, uh, Neil Lash. Um, John came up last week to come and speak at our youth retreat. And while he was, actually he and Pastor Robbie and I were watching the Gator basketball game. And uh, while that, he got news of, of his father um, having a stroke. And anyway, this past week he passed. And I was down with him on Monday and Tuesday, kind of to agree with them. And uh, anyway, I'm going to speak today on this subject of remembering. But John, I'm talking to you in South Florida crew. I know you guys are feeling this more than anybody. And uh, I'm kind of unapologetically going to talk to, uh, to our South Florida church, but us as a church whole. So as I keep looking in the camera and I'm talking to you guys, I love you guys very much. And I got Jaleesa with Jaleesa's in the house with us today. So at least we got a little, yeah, we got some, we got some South Florida love. But if you got your Bible, go to Joshua 4, and if you're ready, say, let's do this. Mm -mm -mm. Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each one of you a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel. If any of you saw the stones <laughs> being placed and pl put in place today, and you, we should have had men do this, because we had some, I, I, I hate to say it like this, they were heavy, these are heavy stones. Anyway, let me keep going. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you. <laughs> Captain Marvel, when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, and they took the 12 stones. Let's pray. Father, help in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So I was just down with Pastor John in South Florida on uh, Sunday night and Monday night because we launched Greenhouse Orlando last week, which, by the way, was just wonderful and precious, and it was beautiful. And some of you guys went there. In fact, there's a lot of you that went there, and so thank you very much for being supportive of that. Uh, but from there, I went down to South Florida, and so I was staying at this hotel. And uh, I don't have the best memory. I'm not sure if any of you guys ever leave things in a, in a hotel. I'm not sure if you guys, Rob Witzel, are you in that? Rob Witzel, what's up, Rob? Good to see you. All right, this is just reunion time. Rob Witzel's in here. All right. Where's Asher? Asher, where are you at in here? You're in here somewhere. I, we, over here. Okay, right here. This is like total reunion time. Anyway, totally distracted, but here it comes. So I'm in this hotel, clearly. So I'm, I'm leaving my hotel, and I had, honestly, probably the best thing that someone can have in life, which is um, chocolate and peanut butter together, pe Reese's peanut butter cups. So I had some, so I had, I had two king size peanut butter cups in my freezer at the place where I was staying. And so the, the, they upgraded me at the room I was in. And so I had like a room with like a fridge and all this. And anyway, I had this. So I'm leaving to take my trip back. I'm going to be on a four or five hour trip back up to North Florida. And you know, I try not to do it too much, but th th like it's one peanut butter cup per hour. You can just pop one of these. The problem was I left and I, by the time I checked out and I'm on the road, I realized I, I had forgotten my peanut butter cups. Now, I have forgotten so many things. So, like, I've, I have forgotten wedding rings. I've, this is my what wedding ring? I, I think I'm on my seventh wedding ring, which is the number perfection. All right, so I'm on the number perfection. This one's now rubber, so this was 1999. So Ruthie's like, yeah, we're not doing any more of your, uh, any of your little memory, whatever happens here. So... So th there's something though. When it, there's something about remembering, and there's something about forgetting, and I don't know exactly what to say about why it is that I have sometimes a very bad memory with certain things. And so this week I was studying the science of memory, and I was just kind of looking through a lot of what ca what happens when we remember things. And what it turns out when you're studying 
kind of what goes on in a brain during this. Turns out that our memories are much worse than we think they are. Now, we swear they're, they're good, but they're really not. Now, we think we remember things, but we don't. And the science behind it is we actually forget a lot of things that we should remember. We remember a lot of things that we should forget. We misremember things. We could pass lie detector tests and tell you that we swear that we remember this correctly, but we're not doing that. Um, in fact, a lot of scientists would say that our memories are like a Wikipedia page. I'm not sure if you've ever uh, gone to Wikipedia, but your memory is like a Wikipedia page. Other, you are able to go in and actually alter your own memories, which is not a super big deal, but the problem is other people can actually do the same thing. Other people can go into your memories, and they can alter your memories as well. The whole time, you would swear that you're telling the truth. Now, this has a lot of consequence when it comes to culturally things where, uh, like when it comes to crimes, for example, they've got something called own race bias. I'm not sure if you have ever heard of this own race bias. Reality is uh, people tend to not remember faces of people that are not their own race. So, for example, we've got, put those two pictures of these guys up here, two of the guys that have worked, um, for, done stuff with us here in town. One of them is Kurt. One of them is Eric. Now, I'm not sure if you could tell this. Both of these, th these guys don't look very similar, yet they both did work in, an, in a neighborhood that was predominantly a third race other than these two. So Kurt is on the left. Eric is on the right. But Eric goes in there now. Kurt is now retired from that post. He's in Atlanta. But the kids that are in the neighborhood still call Eric Kurt because they think he's Kurt. Now, can you tell that these are, that they're, obviously, I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but, but what they're finding is, literally, people, for example, a crime gets committed, and someone will say, I swear to you, I promise, and they can pass a lie detector test and say, I remember the face of the man that did it. The problem is, study after study after study after study has shown that you do not remember, you do not remember faces of other races nearly as well as you think you do. Our memories are kind of jacked up. See, if, if you don't remember, you forget. You ever thought about that? <laughs> if you don't remember things, so we, we forget things that really did take place. We remember things that never took place. Our memories are basically a mess. And the reason this matters is because so much of your life and so much of your identity is going to flow out of your memories. Your memories are a huge deal. Whoever gets your memories in many ways is going to get you, which is why the enemy of your soul wants to take your mind like a Wikipedia page, and he wants to go and reconstruct and deconstruct your memory so that you tell yourself a story that is not true. And then the God of heaven wants to go into your mind. God wants your mind. He wants you to love him with all of your heart and soul and your mind to where you give him your memories, and God comes in. And sometimes it's a little unclear. It'll be like, wait a minute, you know, God, why do you do the things that you do? And you find this in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God would do things like he would set up a rainbow. And he'd create these rainbows that when someone looks at a rainbow, they would just kind of stare at that thing. And while they're looking at the rainbow, while they're staring at the rainbow, he said, I'm giving you the rainbow as a memorial. It's, it's a remembrance. I'm never going to judge the world like that again. I'm never going to have that. Ha the rainbow itself is a memorial from God. Jewish people, and it's sort of an honor of of Rabbi Neil, they'd have tassels. They would, J Jews would, would have these tassels that would be like a, a, a remembrance. It helps you to remember the law of God that a kid could even reach down and, and touch it. I don't know if any of you ever play with your hair, but kids would like play with the tassels and they would, they'd be able to touch it. There's this constant reminder, the very feasts of God, Passover and Sukkot, the, the, the feasts of God, the festivals of God, they were memorials of what God had done and who God was and who we are. These were reminders. These were memorial. These were ways to get you to remember. There is power in remembrance. This week we're remembering Neil Lash. God values remembering, but I, but I want to make this clear. God doesn't just value remembering. He values active remembering, not passive it's not a glancing. When you are remembering something actively, you're not just glancing at it, you're staring at it. And that's the whole sermon today. It's simply this. What you stare at, you steer toward. What you stare at, you are going to steer toward, which is why the battle for your soul is a battle for who will get the stare, not the glance. Not the glance. You can glance at anything, and that's why you can glance at the peanut butter cups, but if you don't stare at them long enough, you're going to forget them. That's why you can glance at the words of God, but if you don't stare at them, they don't get a hold of you. Lo que, lo que miras te diriges. Is that how you say it? You know, what you, what you stare at, you're going to steer toward. So how do we do it? 
Well, we're going to take a look in this passage. Number one, you're going to have to own your stare. In verse 7, own your stare. Then you shall tell them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. You're going to have to own your stare. Joshua says, set up these stones as a memorial that when you look, I want you to come look at these. I want you to bring your kids to this memorial. Own your stare. So when I was in Pakistan, it's kind of interesting because um, culturally, you, you don't make eye contact with especially people of the opposite sex. So people would tell us on the streets, like, hey, make sure you do not make eye contact. It can be very offensive. Uh, it can be very dangerous to your health, to which one of the guys said, well, I can't help what I look at. And if there's a beautiful woman, I can't help but look. To which someone said back, you better help but look because it could be dangerous to your health. He said, and sure enough, on the trip, he found a way to own his stare. He, he figured out a way that even though he can't do it in the United States, he found a way. And that does kind of help when a woman was covered from head to toe and, and her head was covered and her whole body was, you couldn't see anything, you know. But, it did, but the point was, you've got to own your stare. You better help it. And what he's saying now is he's like, listen, I'm giving you these stones and I want you to own your stare. Now, a lot of us, we kind of feel like, well, memories are something that I've got no control over, to which I would say that is incorrect. That where you set your mind is something that you cannot control, which is incorrect. You get to control what you glance at, and you get to control what you stare at. You get to control what you set your mind on. You get to control. That, that is in your control. You've got to own your stare. And that's what today is about. Today is about actively, intentionally remembering. In fact, would you look at some next to you that right now in South Florida? Would you just say, remember? Right here at the hub, just say, remember. What you stare at, you steer toward. What you stare at, you steer toward. Now, I, 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 when I think about this passage, and it's curious to me because 40 years earlier, the people of Israel passed through on dry ground. They walked through the Red Sea. Now God's doing, it's not the same miracle, but it's a similar miracle. They're now walking across the Jordan. And it's a little bit, I don't know, it almost seems frivolous. It almost seems like, why is God parting a Jordan River? There's other, I mean, there, there's ways that you can do this without needing a miracle. Why is God doing a miracle? And what's up with the memorial stones? What's happening with this? But, but I, I sometimes talk to people and they will say things like, man, if God would show me a miracle, then I'd be faithful. If God would do something amazing, then, then, I, would, then I would obey. Then I would be able to be generous. Then I'd be able to be whatever it is. The problem is the children of Israel, they pass through on dry ground. God delivers them for Pharaoh. He does 10 plagues. They walk through dry ground. Uh, the horse of the rider are thrown into the sea. They are marvelously delivered. They get across to the other side. You might remember they, they sang the song. Miriam is singing, and they're playing tambourines, and, and Moses is doing his thing. And it's an amazing, and if you could, I mean, I don't know about you, I would have sort of liked to have seen the actual footage of walking through on dry ground. And you can see, I don't know if you, any of you saw, what was it, Prince of Egypt, where you see like a big whale and the Red Sea or something like that. I mean, that'd be pretty sweet to be like, oh, check out Shamu, you know, whatever. And you're doing your thing. And you get across. Surely, what I think what we think is, if I experience something like that, man, I would be faithful to God. And yet what we find out is, they get across the Red Sea. Moses goes up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And in a matter of weeks, the children of Israel are not just forgetting about what God's done. They're worshiping a golden calf. Okay, why am I saying that? Because I need you to know that God could show you the greatest spiritual special effects in all of history. And it will never be enough if you don't learn to remember. Which is why they now pass the Jordan and they get across the Jordan. God's like, all right, and everyone's like, oh, that's amazing. And you can imagine the kids like, that was incredible. Have you ever seen anything like that? But now God is like, okay, Joshua says, set up the stones of memorial that bring your kids back to this place so that in generations to come, you guys are going to remember in days to come. In fact, let's get clear, in weeks to come, because you could be touched by God on Sunday and by Wednesday you're acting like a wretch because you didn't learn to stare. Because it's, it becomes tempting to come to church and to give it a glance and then to go back to work on Monday and you give it a stare. But what you stare at, you steer toward and you got to own your stare. Say it one more time. Say remember. So you've got to own your stare. You choose 
what apps you download on your phone. You choose what social media you look at. You choose what you look at on Netflix. You are the one that chooses the music that plays in your car. You are the one that chooses to focus on one thing or another. And what we're talking about here is what you stare at, you steer toward, because when you stare, you make it real. When you stare, you make it vivid. Can we just say the word vivid? There's a word in Spanish um, that, that where we get, it's kind of like a root word, you know, vivir, like the idea of like to live. When something becomes vivid, something becomes real. It's, it, becomes, it becomes alive. And so when I was down in South Florida this week, it was, it was really, you know, precious. I got, to, I got to spend some time with John's mom, Jamie, and so I was at her house, and I was just hearing her tell the stories of Neil. And she would just describe Neil, and she was, I mean, they've been married, I think it was a 48 years, am I getting this right? 48 years, they've been married, and they've just, they've just walked through life together, you know, and it's just precious. And, and I remember, because a few years ago, um, Neil and Jamie were up in Gainesville, and, and it was Thanksgiving, and we were over at Keith's Perry, Keith Perry's place, and so, and there was like a, a beach volleyball court. I, I can't remember how many years ago this was, but I know Neil was in his upper 70s. I'm pretty sure he was in his upper 70s, and we were playing volleyball on Thanksgiving Day after we had eaten out in this beach volleyball court. And there was Neil Lash, 75, 6, 7, whatever it was, Neil Lash out there jumping and playing volleyball. And I was looking. I'm like, man, blessed are you. Check you out. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think it'd be pretty cool to be playing beach volleyball when you're like 77 years old. I mean, that sounds like the blessing of the Lord, you know? And in fact, I know that you guys in South Florida know this, but um, the day that Neil had his stroke that morning, he got up, he played the greatest game of golf of his life, went and had a, uh, got home, was in a good mood, so he went and told Jamie, I want to take you on a romantic, I think they went on like a romantic lunch date, if I'm getting this right. And then he goes home, takes a nap, wakes up, was in a great mood, wanted to go to a hockey game. So he went to the Florida Panthers game. And at the Panthers game, he was screaming and cheering, and I think that's where the stroke happened, you know? All I got to say is if you're going to go out, that's kind of a great way to go out. You know, being romantic with your wife and hitting a good game of golf, and everywhere he went, he was leaving a trail of the kingdom of God as he would bless people where he went. Okay, why am I telling you that? Because you get to own your stare. When I heard Jamie, when I hear John, when I would hear people describing, even some of you in our church that have described the effect that Neil had on you, there's a way that when you even retell the stories, you relive the reality, and when you relive the reality, it has that same effect on you again. See, the one who owns your memories directs your life, which is why God wants to own your memories. Who owns your memories? Who, who, gets, who gets the influence over your, God is saying, I want to be the Lord of your memories. Some of you are looking back on a past that is painful, and God is inviting you to let him in. Because you will see that even in the hardest moments, God never left you. God never forsook you. God has been there the whole time. Number one, if you want to walk in strength, you're going to have to learn to own your stare. When we remember the wrong things, we get weak. When we remember the right things, we get strong. Number one, own your stare. Number two, it's not enough to own it. You're going to have to reproduce it. Reproduce your stare. In verse five, he says to them, he says, each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask you in time to come, what do these stones mean? Que significan eso? What do these stones represent? And he says to them, it's not enough for you to simply have an encounter with God. Parents, you need to reproduce an encounter with God. It is not enough for you to simply have encounters and realities with you and Jesus. Disciple makers, you have got to put this in the generations to come. 2 Timothy 2.2 says that we're to train things to people and we're to hand things off to teach these things to faithful men who will teach them to other faithful men. In other words, God wants generations of reproducing the stare. Hey, parents, listen to me. If your children are forced to come to church on Sundays, but all they ever do is glance at Jesus, but then they stare at their cell phone all week long, don't be surprised when the cell phone has more sway than Jesus. If you give God glances and you give the world the stare, just know this, you are going to follow your, you will follow the stare. What you stare at, you steer toward. It is a law. There is no way around this. You cannot glance at the kingdom and then stare at the world and then wonder why you don't see the kingdom coming on the earth as it is in heaven. This is why we are to set our minds on things above, not on things of earth. I will, I'm going to glance at the world. I'm going to live in this world. But we are to be people that continually are lifting our gaze higher and higher and higher and more and more and more eternal. And we say, God, you will get my stare. We have to reproduce 
the stare. We've got to reproduce this. I hear people say sometimes, uh, well, man, I, you just got, I just got to learn. I'm one of those people that just got to learn the hard way. Well, if, you're, if you just have to learn, if you just have to learn the hard way, then you are a fool. What wise people do is they say, wait a minute, my parents made those 10 mistakes. I am never going to make the mistakes. My par- I'm going to learn from my parents. Parents, we need to set up memorial stones Stones of remembrance, stories where we're able to go back and say, hey, kids, hey, hey, generations to come, I want you to remember what the Lord has done. It happened this week. We had our first deacons meeting this week. It was the first deacon board meeting that we've had with, where we had women on the deacon board. And we were just kind of going through some of the things. And we were in the financial report. And Dave Failer was given the financial report. And, and we were looking back over the, we were thinking over the past like 10, 12 years. And again and again and again and again and again, we have watched God come through. I mean, we would hit moments where there'd be no money. The, the, the money would be bad. And, 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 you know, one of the brothers was bringing up how we'd go into these meetings. And, and honestly, this has been our thing. If money gets bad, we say, okay, let's go be more generous. Let's not get less generous. Let's get more generous. And so when the money got bad, we'd go, we, would, we would even come to the staff and say, staff, you are in a spending freeze. No one is spending money out of any of your budgets. Don't spend any money. But then we'd go into deacon's meeting and say, we're going to go give more money away to the poor and to church planting and to missions. And we'd go give more money away. And, and this is been the, guys, this has been our story for like 10, 12, 14 straight years. Every single time it happens, God comes through. Now, that's not why we do it. I'm not saying that's why we do it. What I'm telling you, and by the way, we've never had a year where the staff did not get to spend all of their budget. Like literally, that never, those spending freezes never even lasted more than two months. We have watched it again and again. I talk to pastors, and they're like, uh-oh, we, we better, stop, uh, better stop giving to missions. To which we're like, oh, no, no. I'll tell you what we will not do. We will not neglect the poor. We will not neglect the world. We will not neglect the mission field. We will not neglect those things. Why? Because there's this stone that's on our shoulder at this point that we walk around with this thing. And we're like, wait a minute. We've got this remembrance stone that we have set this thing up. And when I get tempted to be greedy, I come back and I'm like, wait, I remember what God has done. Church, do you have memorial stones? Have you set up the stones of remembrance in your family? Have you given us, have you brought your kids back and said, look at this? Have we brought our disciples and said, check this out? This is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. So you've got to own the stair, but then you've got to reproduce the stair. When I was with John this week and I was asking him what, what, you know, what was going to happen with his dad's body. And we were just talking like cremation or, or not. And, he's, and when I mentioned cremation, he says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what our people do. I was like, oh, that's right. You're Jewish. Because for generations, this is what Jewish people have done. You will not cremate our body because our body's going to stay intact. Because it will be a memorial and it's going to be a remembrance and it's going to be a declaration. My body may be dead now, but there's a day that's coming when God's going to raise the dead. And my body's going to be ready. Now, guys, listen, I'm not making any theological statements about that. If someone got burned up in a ship, we all know that God can take the little bits of ashes and, and he can bring it back together. That's not my point. My point is, it was so cool that when I'm talking to John, his very first, oh, no, 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 that's not what our people do. In other words, there's this, there's this stone of remembrance for the people of God. Like, oh, no, 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 no. We've got this remembrance. We have the God. Have you ever heard of Lazarus? Lazarus rose from the dead. Have you ever heard of these, the, this little child that was in a, you know, was in a, you know, a sepulchre? How do you say that in English? Um, what's that word? I forget what the word is. Anyway, I forget what it is. You know, a, kid, a little kid that's, that's, I hope this doesn't fall. This little child and Jesus goes by and there's a, in a casket. Like there's this little casket and, and Jesus raises. We serve the God who raises people from the dead. And there is coming a day when he is going to raise up the living and the dead when Jesus comes back. Like John was like, no, no, I, I, my, dad, my dad has taken me to those. And that's what John would tell you. He's, his dad has taken him to the stones of remembrance. Own the stair. Number two, you've got to reproduce the stair. I, I, was, I remember I, when I went to Israel on one of the trips, someone was kind of throwing some shade on the Holocaust. And like, you know, just a little bit of doubt, like, did it really happen? Is it as, was it as bad as everybody said? You know, and, and guys, there, there is a, there's a reality of anti-Semitism in the world. Like, just so you know, there is. And I remember we went to, the first time I went, we went to the Holocaust Museum and someone whose heart was hardened, all of a sudden, when they went back to the memorial and they looked, and all you have to do is walk through the Holocaust Museum, and it is just flat out sobering. As you remember what, what Jews went through, and you remember how they suffered, it does something to you. If any of you have ever visited the, 
Museum of African American History here in the United States, it just kind of, it takes you down, you go down and you go down through time. And, and uh, if you go up to, in Alabama, there's a, there's a lynching memorial, a memorial of lynching. And so when people get to those moments of like, when we, when we start to forget where we've been, when we start to forget the crimes of our past, when we start to forget the realities and the depths of the wretchedness of what human sin can do, something happens when we come back. We're like, no, no, no. We set up memorials. We set up museums. We set things up to come back and to act, watch, not glance, not passively, actively stare. Remember what has happened because what you stare at, you steer toward. And it does something to you. You've got to own the stare. You've got, to, you've got to reproduce the stare. By the way, this is one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of microchurches. When I was a youth pastor one time, I remember this kid went to a youth retreat and just got rocked. I mean, like Jesus moved in this young person's life. And, and I mean, there was healings and there was deliverances. And, and God spoke and God was calling and God was doing all these amazing things. And, and this kid just comes back. And we've all, we've all kind of heard this. Some people call it like jailhouse religion, youth camp religion. Someone goes and has this encounter with God. But then sure enough, a couple weeks later, it starts to wear off. And listen to me very carefully. If you don't learn to steward the grace of God in your life, if all you do is glance at the grace of God in your life, you're going to be like the Israelites coming through the Red Sea 40 days later. You're already worshiping a golden calf, and Satan's going to come. The enemy of your soul is going to come and say, you know, remember when you were having a quiet time the other day and you thought you heard God's voice? Remember when you were in church and you felt God's presence? Remember when you went to breakthrough and God was moving in power? Remember when you were at that big event and you were at some worship concert and, man, you were like, there was like goosebumps all over, and you're like, wait, I think that was God. Remember when you were in that place and and God was, and they're going to have all these encounters and realities with God. But with the passing of time, if you don't set up the memorial stones, what happens is the enemy of your soul comes in and throws shade on it and says, did that really happen? And when you start to wonder, well, I wonder if that was God. Maybe that was just my mind. Maybe that was. And I remember this young person went to a microchurch, went to like one of these youth small groups. And his small group leader was like, he's like, you know, John, man. What are you talking about? Do do you remember? And he started telling him the story. He said, no, man, I was there. I was there with you. I saw, and all of a sudden, he starts to get aroused again, and he remembers, oh, wait, 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 wait. What God did was real. It's God's job to part the Jordan. It's your job to set up the stones. Church, have you set up memorial stones in your microchurches? Because when you even come together as a microchurch, sometimes I think it's, it's good to say something like, hey, before we get into whatever we're doing tonight, does someone just have something great that God's done? Can we, could we retell the, the deeds of God today? Is there something we need to remember that God has done? All right, Mike, how do I apply this sermon? It's quite simply. I, I'm asking you today to build your memorial. There's, right here, I've got 12 stones. There are 12 stones He tells them to go into the Jordan River. They cross the Jordan. He tells the elders to go back into the middle of where the Jordan was. The ark was there. Pick these things up. Put them. He says, pick up these 12 stones. Church, I'm calling you today to set up your memorials. Moms and dads, I need you to set up memorials. College students, I need you to set up memorials. Senior citizens, I need you to set up memorials. He said 12. You don't need 100. You need a few. You need a few go-to rocks that you're able to go to that you identify with because in some way, you identify with the memories of your life. Your memories do something. He chose one from each of the tribes of Israel. So if this one right here was the tribe of Benjamin, this was like the, I don't know if they put a a name on it. I don't know if little kids went and did graffiti on it. I don't know if they had little emojis on it. I don't know what they did. But when this got set up, anyone from the tribe of Benjamin would come back and say, man, that is my stone. Let let me say it more in, in 21st century vernacular. Simba, remember who you are. Because if you're from the tribe of Benjamin, you identify with that. Man, church, we need history with God. That when someone comes, when the enemy comes and is trying to throw you off track, you're like, man, let me just take a trip back to this. I mean, that's, the, that's Judah, man. I'm Judah. That's my tribe. That's my tribe. John, I forget what you were saying. You're, didn't your dad say, hey, make sure you tell your kids you guys are Levites. Is that what you guys are? Is it the tribe of Levi? I think that's what you guys are. You know, I, 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 I'm from the tribe of Melchizedek. That's the claim. That's the tribe I claim. <laughs> Jesus was of the order of, so I'm just going to go ahead and go with that. But yeah, so the, we come back and we find our identity. See, see watch. 
You do not get to choose what happens to you in life. You do get to choose how you set up stones. You do not get to choose what is done to you. You do get to choose how you tell the story of what was done with you because you can either tell the story of people that abused you without God in the mix or you can tell the story of a people who abused you but there's a God who splits Red Seas and there's a God who opens Jordan Rivers. You get to choose the memorial stones you set up. Set up the memorial stones, church. Remember, remember. Remember, because what you stare at, you steer toward. Mike, what does this mean? This means when you look at your life and you remember what God hasn't done, you get bitter and angry. When you look at your life and remember what God has done, you get faith and joy. You get to choose what stones. And you know what a lot of the problem is? A lot of us, instead of going to the memorial stones, we keep going back to like, I I just call them like silly rocks. We're like, man, I remember when I remember when I prayed and I didn't get healed. Man, I remember. I remember, man, my, my, that boss that was mistreating me. Gosh, man. Oh, yeah, Michael Scott is my boss. And there it is. Yep, there, yep, there it is. Yep. Oh, look at And we, we keep going back to the wrong rocks. Drop your rocks and get to the memorial stones because when you forget what God has done, you're going to steer in the wrong direction. What you stare at, you will steer toward. God will open Jordans. God will open rivers. Only you can stare at the stones. Hey, church, could, even when we come on Sundays, could, could we stop glancing? Like sometimes I'll, I'll even be at church and I'm tempted to like take out my phone and and it, like I'm looking at sports or something. Like right now, it's it's helpful because since the Gators are not in March Madness, I don't even care about March Madness now. I said, "Oh, forget March Madness. It's stupid anyway." You know, <laughs> such a waste of time. There's an eternity waiting, and and there's the things of eternal value. Why would I, <laughs> why would I waste my life on something so futile, and frivolous? But if the Gators were still in there, I'd be remembering. I don't even know what round we're in. I forgot what round we're in because right now, March Madness gets a glance while something else gets a stare. But when, you, when I come to God, sometimes I'm even reading my Bible, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll be, I mean, this is why I turn my Bible up, and I turn my phone down when I go to seek the Lord in the morning or at night. It's worthy of turning your phone off sometimes so that you give God the stare instead of the glance. Because sometimes I seek the Lord with a glance and I'm wondering why I'm not getting the fruit of a stare. Set up the memorial stones. You gotta set up the memorial stones. See, build your memorial. We, we, hear, we know this from some of the songs. I mean, Michael, what, what does this look like in the real world? It means things like count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done. I mean, you wake up in the morning, scripture even says, come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. I think sometimes there's something good about saying, Lord, I'm going to look back over the last week and remember what you have done and remember how you came through and remember how good you've been and remember, I'm going to remember what I know because I'll promise you this, I'm going to get to heaven one day when some angel's going to come up and show me like a video and say, hey son, I just want to show you a little video of all those times when you didn't even know it, but God was saving your backside and you didn't even know it. And for all of eternity, we're going to be saying praise be to the living God and there's going to be memorial stones of heaven forever and ever. We're going to say glory to God in the highest. Mm, mm, mm. The music. I mean, I even, I even think about things like when you're telling your story, how do you tell your story, man? How are you doing? Do you tell your story with God or without God? It, it's wild to me. Sometimes I'm looking for pity from people, and so I, tr- I go ahead and I, I omit God because you can only get pity if God's not in the equation. Because if God's in the equation, if God before you, who could be against you? But sometimes, like, when I want to kind of play the card, I'm a victim, you know, oh, my, woe is me, life stinketh, you know, something like that. I have to leave God out. I have to make sure I'm only coming over to little rocks. I don't get to go here because it's really hard for me to tell a pity story when I'm behind these rocks. Look what the Lord has done. I mean, drop the rocks and look what the Lord has done. Even, I think about even the theme music. Sometimes, like, I was driving uh, up from South Florida and I was putting the music, just going through stations, you know, and, and there's some music you just don't need to listen to. There's music you don't need to listen to. Like when I'm watching Gator football games sometimes, sometimes I don't want to hear the announcers because I know they're evil and biased against us. <laughs> so I would rather listen to Mick Hubert, which is the voice of the Gators. I'd rather watch it with Mick Hubert because now I know I'm getting the unadulterated true version of what's happening. <laughs> right? I want the true version. I don't want that biased garbage, you know? You ever watched a movie and you, because the music is ominous, you already know, oh, this is going to be bad, you know? 
this is going to be bad. You know, unless it's like Jordan Peele and you're not sure if it's like a horror or a comedy, you know, something. But other than that, it's, it's like you're, you're listening to music. And if it's ominous, guys, we got, we got to start owning the theme music of our life. I mean, some of us are sitting here like, oh, my gosh, look at this. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to try. I'm not, and we're like, oh, my gosh. And we're sitting here juggling all the, we're juggling the wrong theme music. God's like, could you get the right music, please? I am on the throne. I am sovereign. I know what I am doing. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I adopted you as my own. I didn't abandon you on the cross. I'm not going to abandon you now. Get the right stones. Greg, I want you to get ready to take it here in just a second. I'm going to hand this over to you down in South Florida or John or whoever's going to be doing this. But, but I just want to end it like this, man. When, when you look, I want you to look what the Lord has done. And then I want you to talk about what the Lord has done. I mean, a big part of this, the application of this message today is we build our memorial stones when we tell the story. We build our memorial. We got, you got to go tell the story. You got to go tell the story. And then you need to expect more of what God has already done. And, and, I, and I love this because in verse 20, I'm going to end it here in 19. It says, the people, they came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. I don't want to make more of this than it is, but I don't want to make less of it. And, in, and if Neil Lash was here right now, I know what Neil Lash would say. He would say this. You know, Mike, you do realize that the 10th day of this month would have been the very day that just a generation earlier, that was the day in Exodus 12 where they would say, each man must take a lamb for his house, a lamb without blemish, one year old, and slaughter that lamb for the Passover. Is it a coincidence that the day that God does this is the very day that the children of Israel were to be celebrating the Passover where there was a lamb that was slain, where the blood was put on their doorposts, whereby they passed through on dry land. On that day, jogging that memory, I'm telling you guys, he wants your memory, he wants your memory, he wants your memory, we gotta create memories. The best thing that happens in a friendship is when you create memories. Do you remember when, do you remember that? Remember, Mike, remember, 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 remember? I like when my kids say, remember, 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 remember daddy, remember daddy, remember? And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, in other words, this isn't even just you and your kids. you got to own this stair. You've got to reproduce this stair so well that coming generations keep telling the stories of God. They keep telling the stories of God. Troy launched Orlando last week, and their first offering was an offering for missions. They took none of the money. The first offering was just for missions because he said, we come from a tribe that knows. When we give generously, God always comes through. See, we're trying to reproduce this for generations to come. What do these stones mean? Verse 22, then you will let your children know. Then you will let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, just like the Lord did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Okay, Mike, why do you say this? Okay, th- this is what's called a testimony. This is a testimony, all right? The Hebrew word for testimony is, it's ehud, all right? Say that, ehud. The idea behind a testimony was this. The word in Hebrew for testimony, it, it was a word that would get used like in court where someone would have to come back and double back around and tell the story again. The judge would say, tell me what happened again. And so he would reduplicate the story. He would repeat the story but it's a word that basically means do it again. You see, my friends, stones of memorial, they're not simply statements of what God did in the past. They're invitations of what God wants to do all over again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. So my little girl, Anaya, when we were in Israel and Ruthie was pregnant and she had a hole in her heart, the doctor suggests we consider abortion because she's not going to thrive and make it. And Ruthie says, no, we're going to pray that Jesus will heal her heart and make her better and heal my baby for the glory of God. And so she comes back and we didn't have the abortion and, and we come back and they do the test and they do another test and another test and another test. And sure enough, her heart was healed in the name of Jesus. In the name Anaya. 
means the Lord answers. So Aniah's very name is a constant reminder. I probably tell her 50 to 100 times a year, Aniah, do you know where you got your name? Do you know what your name means, Aniah? Do you understand that your name means the Lord answers? But watch, your name is not just a description of what God did in the past. Your name is an invitation of what he wants to do all over. Do it again, God. Do it again, God. Do it again. See, there's an expectation that comes. Lord, this is why it says in Revelation 12, 11, it says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. How do we overcome? We overcome because Jesus got us through the Red Sea. We, get, we overcome because Jesus got us across the Jordan. But we overcome when we set up the memorial stones. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. That's the work of God sovereignly and by the word of our testimony. Only his blood can sanctify you. Only his blood can set you free. Only his blood can change your life, but only your mouth can keep you going. It's the word of your testimony. It's the word of your testimony. It's the word of your, set up the stones. John Lash, man, your dad left you a heritage. I rejoice in the fact that Neil Lash right now is celebrating, and we remember him this day today, and we set up a fresh memorial and say, may God receive all the glory and all the honor now and forever. And that's what he says here, by the way, so that all the peoples of earth may know. And I want all the peoples of earth, and if you're watching this online, in fact, I'm going to pause right now, because even this morning praying, and I felt like this was for something subsequent to right now, I don't know if someone's watching, but even someone that, I don't know if you're like at the 1115 service, or if you're watching this online, but somebody that you have been drunk, or high, or stoned, or in a fog, and I believe I'm supposed to say to you, right now, come sober in Jesus' name, listen to these words, the living God will set you free, wake up from your stupor, and turn to the living God. In Jesus' name, wake up, wake up, wake up, I'm talking to you, yes, you needed a sign, this is your sign, wake up and serve the living God, wake up and run to God, because he's running to you right now. Wake up. See, he's done it before, he can do it again. He can do it again. He can do it again. You can expect. I'm telling you guys, when you tell the story, it does something to your heart. But I'm going to end it like this, man. This is all, Joshua is the greatest Jesus. Joshua is the Old Testament name of the New Testament name, Yeshua, which is where we would say Jesus. And Jesus is all about memories. I mean, he would go and heal someone. He, he didn't just heal him. He spit in a guy's eye. That's memorable. They're like, Lord, we need, we need to pay some taxes. He says, okay, I, I'll tell you what. Go over to a fish. Hey, Peter, there, there's some money in a, in a fish's mouth. Go get the money out of the fish's mouth, and let's go pay these taxes. I mean, let's be clear. Jesus could have just been like, I happen to have a few denarii in my pocket. <laughs> he's so much cooler than that. I mean, I just I mean, imagine. He's like, you know, I don't know how long it would have been earlier, weeks earlier or something like that. An angel in heaven, God speaks to an angel and says, hey, angel. Get a little kid to throw some money or get someone to drop something overboard to get this fish to eat this thing. And he gets the whole thing planned because he's already, he's planning a memory. He's planning a memory. He wants your memories. Hey, microchurches, we got to create memories together. Hey, disciples, you got to get memories with God. He, he's getting this memory going. Jesus is always about these, these memories. It's, it's, Lord, do it again. Do it again. Peter denies Jesus. He denies Jesus around a charcoal fire. He was warming himself around a charcoal fire, the, the fumes of the charcoal in his nostrils. He denies Jesus, weeps bitterly. It's been multiple days. Jesus then raises from the dead after he died on a cross. When he rose from the dead, he's up on the land cooking some fish. Jesus is looking at Peter, who's off on a boat. Peter sees Jesus, jumps out of the water, swims up to him, runs up to him, sees the Lord. And there's this little tiny detail. Scripture says that Jesus was cooking the fish he's about to feed Peter on a charcoal fire. I wonder if he remembered the smell. I wonder if charcoal for the rest of his life would be redeemed by Jesus. Because you know what, guys? This is how it goes. The charcoal smell that at one point was his very failure. He failed Jesus around a charcoal fire. But now he's going to get restored by Jesus around another charcoal fire. It's like Jesus goes, see, see, I need you catching this, man. I need you catching this. When Jesus goes up on the cross, he's remembering us. He's, he's remembering. He, 
It's not, watch, it's not just that our sins are forgiven. It's not that, that's true, but it's not just that. I don't just remember that my sins are forgiven. I remember that my king was on a cross. My king was on a cross. I mean, even now, it's like, it's like what is Jesus doing? Look at you. I mean, he's, my, Jesus remembered me on the cross, which is why when there was a thief on the cross next to Jesus, do you remember what the thief said to Jesus? Lord, remember me which was the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise that God would make a covenant with his people. He would remember his covenant and he would remember their sins no more. So watch, it's, it's not like what some people try to do now where they say, well, it never happened, I never sinned, let's just pretend like nothing ever happened. No, 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 that's denial. Things happened, you blew it, you were a failure. Peter, you denied Jesus. Yes, you committed all sorts of sins and wretchedness. It's not that your sins never happened. When I look back, I don't just try to negate the sins. I remember my God because Jesus doesn't just take my sins and act like they're not there. He covers them with his blood. So Jesus goes up on a cross in my story is that even in my deepest, darkest failures, he's so great, he can even turn my wretchedness into his glory. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Does anyone do this? Is, is anyone like that? Is there anything like that in the whole universe? Greg, would you take it in South Florida and call people to respond?